And here is Kermit opening the gate. Let's go and have some fun today. Hello everyone and uh, welcome again on the Vintage Aviation News uh, YouTube channel. Uh, this is a very little surprise. I was not planning to be here this uh, weekend in Orlando and if you are in Orlando, what are you going to do? You don't go to the parks, you call Kermit Wiggs and you go see Fantasy of Flight. You know, who cares about the parks, right? Uh, jokes aside, I haven't seen Kermit in person in quite some time. Uh, last time I visited was way before COVID. And I know Kermit has always uh, something going on and in particular phase, phase three. So I thought uh, this would be a good opportunity for us to catch up and, you know, share, share what are the latest uh, news and plans for, uh, for phase three. Yeah, right? yeah, act three. So, act three. Act three. Act three. Act three. Yeah. There you go. So if you take it, let, let us know what's going on, Kermit. Well, you know, we, we opened here in, uh, 1995, which is basically what I call Act Two. I think I always say act, all great stories come in three acts. Act One was uh, the Weeks Air Museum in Miami. It opened in 1985. I was already looking at property up here in Central Florida as we were opening in uh, in Miami. Um, realized very quickly that uh, being on an airport was not the greatest place to get a bunch of you know people through. It was a great place to fly the airplanes and all that, but it was a start. And I was the energy just kind of led me up to Central Florida because this is where the tourist industry was. Sure. I thought this is where I need to be. So followed the energies, you know, eventually bought this property that we're on in 1987. So I saw the property before we actually opened the museum at the end of 1985. Uh, purchased uh, three pieces I put together, which is in effect, you know, the, mm -hmm. uh, the property that we're on. And basically uh, Act 1 ended with Hurricane sure. Andrew. Uh, Act Two opened here in 1995, 10 years later. And then in 2014, I closed this facility, uh, which was only ever intended to be my shop. And uh, we had basically, uh, you know, built another hangar across the way over here. And that was, uh, this was all shut down for uh, one year. Then I decided, hey, I need to keep something going sure. for my gift shop to maintain my trademarks keep my sign out on the interstate four. So basically, uh, I'm telling everybody, you know, uh, take a bathroom break, go get a hot dog and a Coke or whatever, and uh, wait for Act 3 to be yeah. So I'm still waiting, you know. Sure. But it seems to me, I've been talking to you for, for a long time, that even in uh, during Act 1, you always had a vision for something more than just a four walls with airplanes in it. Because even, even back in those days, it, it, it didn't cut it, you know. You, museums are a hard thing to run, and if you just have a place where they're easy to run, they're hard to pay for. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But also, you know, you always had this vision for inspiring people, which yeah. really I like, I like a lot. So why don't you talk, talk to us? Well, about that? you know, it's interesting. I've always had two parallel paths in life. I've never had anything to do with each other. One everybody knows me for, which is a fascination with physical flight. Airplanes is an expression of that. Like, Flew on the US aerobatic team and designed sure. shared airplanes and uh, collected, uh, you know, a lot of uh, vintage airplanes for the collection. And but I've always had a metaphysical fascination with inner flight. And I've uh, done a lot of exploration of consciousness. I've never done any drugs in my life. Never smoked pot. Nothing. Okay. And uh, because nobody would believe my stories, and I've not really let the public know what's going on on the woo-woo side, we'll call it. Uh, I had 
early in my early 20s, I started having conscious out of body experiences. Um, and I knew there's, I know there's ghosts because I've been one. I've left this form, floated through walls and ceilings. Nothing fantastic ever happened. I never bumped into any entities or whatever, you know, but it was like, this is really cool. So it kind of led me beyond myself within that realm. And eventually I got led to uh, go to the Monroe Institute up in uh, Virginia, south of Charlottesville. Uh, Bob Monroe created a technology back in the uh, 60s, or early 50s, late 50s, I mean, uh, to basically, they, they knew by putting EEG things on people, meditating, things like that, when people would either be in meditative states or, or have mystical experiences or connect with other realities, they could measure the brain waves. So what Bob Monroe did is he created a, uh, a sound technology that he patented called Hemisync. And what he did is he put uh, a certain frequency in this ear, a certain frequency in this ear, and what would happen was the brain would discount that as white noise, but it would entrain itself into the disresonant frequency. As an example, you know, we live in a, a beta world, okay? Our frequency range of the human experience is, uh, you know, we can only hear up to a certain frequency range, and we know can so we blow a dog whistle and see the dog react and measure it, but we can't hear it in this human form, okay? And on the low end of that, uh, the human ear can't hear below 28 cycles a second. And so what happens is that what they determined was where you have these mystical experiences is in the alpha and the theta ranges, which are the delta range goes from zero to four cycles a second. The uh, alpha and the theta ranges go from four to eight and eight to 12 cycles a second, but that's below the human audible experience. So what Bob did is he created basically, you know, for the airplane people, you've heard of multi-engine airplane that's cruising along at, you know, 1950 RPM, but the engines are out of sync. Yeah, you hear the white noise of wah, but what you hear is wow, 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 wow. Mm -hmm. So what he did, they were, they're out of sync, okay? So he would put two frequencies in your ear, like 108 cycles in this ear, 100 cycles in this ear, and what would happen was that eight cycle uh, disresonance, your brain would eventually entrain itself into those frequencies. So what Bob Monroe basically created was a, uh, a, a, a way for you to go within and explore your own consciousness, okay? And as an example, you know, when people meditate or when they wake up in the morning, basically, when you're, uh, you, you've woken up in the morning, you haven't opened your eyes yet, you're still within your inner world, but you're aware that there's an outer world, okay? You know you're in your room, you know you're in your mm -hmm. bed, you're gonna wake up and whatever, but you're still within your world, and you know, I mean, I get up numerous times at this age to go to the bathroom at night, you know, and it gives me an opportunity to feel like when I'm waking up again, I really, I'm, I'm still in my world, like in, in, in dreaming and stuff. And so my experiences at the Monroe Institute, and I went there in 06 and 07, and I basically went in, and it took me about five days, these are six day retreats, I did 10 that have uh, accumulated, I'm still finishing up right now, a 1500 page metaphysical book of my experiences. And by my third program, I was recording my experiences while they were happening. Nobody has ever created a book like this. So while you're reading my transcripts of my, we yeah. do four to six, uh, you know, four or five uh, experiences a day that range from, you know, about 45 minutes, um, while you're reading that transcript, you're listening to my voice in real time of the, you know, the yeah. third program to the 10th, you know? And so there's an introductory thing. And I remember you made me listen to uh, a DVD set while one of, the, one of the visits I had here. Is that what you're talking about? No, 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 no. That, the, that's, okay. that, the, I think that was my We Are the Past CD, okay. where you okay. sat in an airplane. That's more of where Fantasy Flight okay. Act 3 is going to go. But, but this, while you're reading my deal, you know, you're listening to my voice in real time. I got a foot in this world with a recorder. Okay, my consciousness is basically in another reality in my green screen. And I can't, I, I, what I'm being shown, what I'm being told, what I'm being, where I'm being taken, I can't control. 
It was like I'm sitting in front of a movie theater and I can't control yeah. what's on the screen. But I mean, oh my God, it was unbelievable. And during the editing process, I realized the, it was fascinating because it started off and I had all these dreams and visions of connecting with higher beings and aliens and dead people and going over my past lives and things like that. And, and, and it started that way. And what happened was everything that I desired to do within these 10 programs, I did it all. I've learned about the, the purpose and the meaning and the essence of all of all realities, you know? We just live in this particular one which is created with light. You know, everything is energy, everything is frequency, and by my friend's definition, everything is light. You just happen to be hearing light at a lower frequency with the ability that we have in this form to, 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 to absorb it. And so, um, what happened was this, this whole thing went around, and by the time I ended up in my last program, I had completed the circle, but I ended up back where I started. And, and it, it was the most unbelievable, I, I mean, I tear up when I think about it, and uh, it was just, it's fascinating. This book has the potential to change a lot of people's perception. So are you it. thinking to incorporate those experiences in Act three. No, what, no, not act necessarily three. because people have to have those on their own. Okay. But but what happens is when you go through and you see my experience, you cannot help but reflect on your own personal experience. That's where Act Three is going to come into creating what I perceive as the next themed entertainment industry. What's going to happen is we're going to use entertainment not as an end product to make change. We're going to use it as a means to an end to your own self-discovery and self-transformation, and it's about change, okay? So what we do is the way we, what we deliver in the way of entertainment is like listening or reading my book. You know, you're going to reflect on, uh, you know, we'll deliver timeless experiences of the human experience, but while we do it, we do it in a way that you can't help, not help but reflect on where you've come from where you're currently at and where you potentially dream to go, okay? And you're within yourself and you're going to determine your future. I'm not going to tell you anything. You're going to walk in my theme park one person. You're going to change yourself inside, leave a different person, and nobody's going to know what went on. And if I can deliver that, I think I'm wrong to something. So I don't want to disappoint our aviation fans, yeah. but this is not only necessarily about, this is not about airplanes. No, it's, fantasy, it's, of flight it's about, beyond it's, well, fantasy of Flight is about flight of the human spirit. I love airplanes. Um, I, it, it, it became a stepping stone in my life to understand, you know, the bigger picture of what was going on. And just to kind of close the loop on my two parallel paths, I basically opened Fantasy of Flight Act 2. And I'm sitting here losing my butt. I mean, I'm like, why did I spend all this money? And I'm like, I, it was so discouraging for me. And so eventually I sat there and I was basically, you know, looking at my doors open here. And I said, okay, I realize that the aviation industry is very, very limited, you know, and especially if you even take it down to, here's the aviation industry, and here's the people in the, the white old airplanes, okay? And I know everybody in the business, you know, they, it's a charity. Every museum is a charity. They have to rely on grants, subsidies, donations, and volunteers, okay? It is not a sustainable business. I learned the hard way. So I have a plan to still make it the greatest freaking aviation place on the planet of old airplanes, but that's only a very small part of it, and it's a means to an end to a bigger deal because I'm going after the rest of the planet. Sure. Okay. You want to talk about Act Three and what, what your well, vision is for it? Well, I've, I've been working on it. Uh, I've had uh, two false starts. I spent a significant amount of money on both deals, and there was certain reasons why I had to shut the project down. The last reason uh, in uh, you know June of 2020 was basically you know the 
pandemic hit and the plant sure. kind of went into lockdown. So basically, uh, and in the process of that, what I realized was that people don't understand what's happening on the planet right now. They are trying to wake people up, okay? There's so much going on behind the scenes that even the people at the highest levels on this planet don't really realize what's going on. You know, after I had my experiences, I went to Monroe. My, my wife, when we uh, hooked up, you know, we dated for a year and a half. She lived in Atlanta. Uh, Fantasy of Life went over in a couple of years. And I basically came, uh, uh, you know, we were dating. And, you know, I, I'd been doing the dating scene for about four or five years. Got serious, invited her to move in with me. And Fantasy of Life went up for a couple of years. And after about three months, one night she started talking in her sleep. By the third night, I had a tape recorder. She trans-channeled for three and a half years, okay? I'm talking to spirit guides, angels, non-human life forms. We're going over past lives. What am I here to do? What fantasy of flight's all about? And that connection was basically, they trained me kind of from the other side to begin to connect with other realities. They would give me dreams I would have to interpret. If I remember, well, last time I spoke to you, you were able to meet Howard Hughes in his experience. That in my third program yeah. at the Monroe Institute, and they said they had never heard of anybody meeting anybody famous. We were, we were in my third program at Monroe, uh, we were uh, pre-briefed to go meet deceased people. That was it. We didn't know who we were going to meet, blah, blah, blah. And I get in there and blah, 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 you know, we did a little affirmation to get in to kind of set the stage of everything. And all of a sudden, you know, within the deal, all of a sudden I felt like I was flying like Warp 3 Star Trek, you know, you know, and the universe was going by. And all of a sudden, poof, I ended up and it was totally dark. And I'm going, okay, I don't know where I am. Uh, I don't know what's going on. And all of a sudden, the first guy walks up and goes, what is it? I've got a very deep spiritual connection with Walt. And uh, basically, we talk for three or four minutes. I've got all this on recording, you know, me describing what's happening. And then he leaves, and I'm just kind of like, like, wow, that was really cool, you know? Thinking to myself, man, I wonder who's next. Freaking Howard Hughes walks up, and I'm like, we talk, and, and he basically, you know, uh, I had seen the Sikorsky S43 at Oshkosh in 1994. I made a mental note, oh my God, one day I'd love to own that. I mean, what aviation enthusiast that collects airplanes go, I would love to have a Howard Hughes' airplane, okay? So, sure enough, you know, I forget about it. Twelve years later, I found myself being uh, inducted into, like, a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Confederate Commemorative Air Force uh, show in Ellington, south of, east of Houston. And, you know, I'd already seen the airplane, but there was no way I could afford it, man. They were in la-la land on the price. And, uh, you know, I went and talked to the guy who was the executive of the estate. Long story short, I forgot about it. Four years later, I'm being inducted. I thought, man, I wonder what happened to the airplane. Well, the Chinese had put in a bid on it, and they were seriously considering it. And it was in the price range that I had, in my mind, said sure. one day. So I borrowed the money to buy the airplane, and anyway, in this, in this thing when Howard was there, at the end we talked for a little bit, oh, I wish I was there to help you, I'm glad you like old airplanes. You know, I saw the HK-1 the year before the Spruce Goose, and he said, ah, oh, thanks for going to see that, blah, blah, blah. And right as they were leaving, he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, Kermit, I had not thought about the S-43 in 12 years. He said, Kermit, I know you're interested in my Sikorsky S-43, I'm going to help you get it. Four years later, the airplane was mine. Wow. That's my world. I mean, it's so bizarre. So just to finish the woo-woo side, you know, uh, the Monroe thing happened. Then I had about a 10-year kind of like trying to figure out now what do I do? Because the, by the time I finished the Monroe Institute, my friends had kicked me out of the Monroe nest and I had to figure out things, but the timing was still unfolding because it's never our timetable. We have to fit organically into the timetable of everything that surrounds us as well, which is frustrating me because I've been working on this for a very long time. You know, I did, I did all these programs, and uh, now I've opened Fantasy of Flight, and, you know, that was, in, we opened in 95, but it was in 06 and 07 I did that. Then I had a 10-year lull, and then I got drawn to a place north of Atlanta, and I took 10 days of in-depth and advanced channeling because I was always fascinated with what my wife did. 
when she trans-channeled, but like Edgar Casey, she was dead asleep. She had no idea what she was saying until she played the tape the next morning, until I played her the deal. And at some point, you know, we would ask questions and blah, blah, blah. And that quit. And then eventually, because I was always faster, I had the Monroe experience. Then I eventually went to this other place and did uh, 10 days of the in-depth and advanced channeling. I've been channeling consciously for over six years now. And the information I've got is un freaking believable where I came from, who I was, who I am, what I'm here to do. And what I learned through this, and you know, when we shut down the, the last time in 2020, uh, you know, working on Act 3, I realized my clientele lies in the future. And what's got to happen is we have to get through this global hump of humanity awakening to what it's been enslaved to and what it's been involved in and how we've been lied to and, and, and I'm connected at, at the highest ends of not only what's pulling the ultimate strings, but the, uh, I'm just going to say the group, I don't want to get too wacko here, but there is a group that has been controlling this planet through the, what we would call the Illuminati cabal, uh, deep state or whatever. They've been controlling the humans to enslave humanity, okay? That is all about to change. And you're seeing the, the, the dissolution of that happening. There is a very, very bright light on the horizon for humanity. Yes. And that is when I just have to wait because the timing is, it's not my timetable. And at some point, humanity is going to wake up. And I don't know if everybody's familiar with Maslow's Pyramid, but basically the bottom end of the pyramid is survival, okay? And then once you learn how to, you know, feed your family and put a roof over your head and that kind of stuff, you begin to move up the pyramid. The top of that is self-actualization, which is ultimately where fantasy of flight's headed, okay? And we use the metaphor of flight to get people to see things in a way to where... I mean, I mentioned this before, you cannot find a more powerful metaphor than flight for pushing our boundaries, reaching beyond ourselves, and freedom. And in the physical world, everybody relates to reaching for the sky, reaching for the stars. That's a metaphor that has nothing to do with airplanes, okay? And within us, we soar in our imagination and we fly in our dreams. That has nothing to do with airplanes. Everyone relates to that metaphor of flight. And so what I eventually realized was, at least in Act 1 here, it's all going to be about airplanes, to use as a means to an end, set dressing to tell timeless stories about the uh, human experience from the past. Okay? Sure. There's going to be three aspects of fantasy of flight in the future, and one of them is going to be the past. I mean, if you think about it, humanity, 100,000 years ago today, and in a million years, is going to be drawn beyond itself. And if you take to the next level, if you're a self of our life form in any reality, this still, you know, is, is true. And so basically what, uh, you know, so what's going to happen is we're going to be able to tell the same timeless stories of humanity within the context of the past, which is Act 1, the present, present. Act, you know, not Act 2, but, you know, yeah. uh, you know, basically, you know, the past, the present, and the future. Sure. So Act 3 basically is going to use the past and common stories of, in, in the other two aspects, the, few, the present and the future, there's going to be no Do you have a timeline? I have no three? timeline. Okay. Ask my friends. Okay. Yeah, I, I've given up on timelines. I'm as frustrated as everybody sure. else. Sure, sure. So one thing, one thing that uh, uh, struck me is that you're definitely a different pyramid than the one that 20, 30 years ago started to purchase and acquire airplanes. See, Everybody is. Yes. Every, ch you change in life, yeah. so obviously. Yeah. You, your interests change, but um, it seems, because I watch you online, your videos, the latest A26 video you just posted, there is still a little in interest in the projects that you have going on. And I love old airplanes. Okay. I love old airplanes. That's never going to go away. Okay. I have a fascination for and, and what we're going to do... And that's what everyone wanted to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, you're Sorry still, about that, guys. <laughs> you're yeah, still yeah. in love with those airplanes. So, so what's going to happen is in the long run is, uh, first of all, you know, anybody that is a person like myself that's a collector of airplanes, at some point, and you've seen this over and over again, 
When the benevolent benefactor is not around or has no interest in paying for the party anymore, the party's over. Sure. Okay? The airplanes get dispersed, they go somewhere yes. else, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Because the bottom line is, this will never be a successful business to engage aviation enthusiasts. There's not enough to pay the light bill. I learned that the hard way. Okay? So, I still, thinking about the aviation enthusiasts, I mean, I have a bigger dream out here, but the reality is, I think Fantasy of Flight, in the long run, will be the focal point on the planet for old airplanes. Because what we're going to do is we're going to use the airplanes and the people that are fascinated with the old airplanes, when they realize that these airplanes are not teaching people about some piece of history and blah, 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 and blah, 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 they're being used to change people's lives. Sure. People leave and they're different people because of what we're delivering. They're going to be even more enthusiastic about what they do. So the airplanes that will be used will still be flying airplanes. We'll be doing rides, that kind of stuff in vintage environments, you know. So there's going to be an early flight period, uh, you know, layout, you know, like Disneyland has Fantasyland, sure. Tomorrowland, Frontierland, Adventureland, or whatever. And Fantasy of Flight's going to be the different periods which aviation, so Pioneer, First World War, Golden Age, World War II, you know, maybe a 50s thing. And so, um, so what I see happening is over here, because this is always intended to be my shop, there will be, you know, tours and things like that, but not this is how, you know, and we do this, this and that. Because what we do anymore over here has no socially redeeming value to society. These old airplanes, they're, they're old airplanes uh, to most people. And they're like, who cares, okay? But they're pieces of art that we're sure. creating that we can jump in and go fly our painting, you know, which is pretty cool. And so what we do is we deliver how we rebuild and stuff in ways that show people how they can understand and discover the sure. potential that they yeah. have within them. Because at some level, every person on this planet is an artist. Sure. We just express ourselves in sure. different ways. So we'll use the expression of the art we do here to touch people on a grander level. Not, I want you to be an old airplane sure. vintage, vintage guy, lover. You know, yeah. vintage yeah. lover, and build parts, you know? Yes, some people will do that, but you know, my, my, my perception of the aviation industry is everybody in the industry is trying to get a bigger piece of a really small pie, okay? And so what I want to do is I'm going to go after the whole biggest pie on the planet, seven and a half billion people, okay? And guess what? I'm going to get a smaller piece, but it's going to be bigger than sure. anything. I, th I think the, the message there that, that, that uh, sticks with me, it's that you always, you always told me, that is the, the point is to discover the potentials within yes. yourself. Because a lot of people don't know they can do it, anything. It doesn't have to be airplanes. So what you're going to do, you're going to show them that using airplanes, using what you have, that you have potentials within yourself, you just have to discover them and uh, be proactive at it. Just don't yeah. be, don't so, be happy. So one of the, what, the, the main thing that, the number one thing that I discovered with these inner explorations was what everything truly is at its core is infinite potential. Mm -hmm. But within infinite potential, there's no experience, only the potential thereof. So in this particular reality that is created with light, okay, and from my perception, uh, you know, the paint with which we paint this with is light, okay? And the paintbrush with which we paint this experience with is consciousness or awareness, okay? And the palette that we happen to choose our colors from is duality, okay? And so, so what happens is, in this world of light, you know, when infinite potential comes metaphorically through the light barrier, okay, all of a sudden it's in the middle of itself, radiating without and within, but it doesn't know what it is because it's in the middle of itself. That's sure. one. Sure. That's the oneness. That's the great I am, okay? Uh, one thing One thing I wanted to touch, and you mentioned it uh, here a minute ago, um, 
there are other collectors and you know they they move on let's put it this way and the collection gets dismantled and gets dispersed have you thought about the Kermit Creek legacy yeah, of yeah, yeah. not only the airplanes but what you're trying to achieve because airplanes are a material thing they can purchase yeah. and sold but we are trying to do it goes beyond that so have you thought about the Kermit Week uh, Kermit Week's legacy in the next 20 30 years well I have an overall plan of, of you know what's kind of been given to me and shown that I've discovered and the bottom line is in the end I do see the potential of the entire collection ending up in a not-for-profit I don't know what not-for-profits are going to mean in the future. I think there's going to be a very... Because the not-for-profits operate based on a perceived tax system, okay? I think a lot of that's going to go away in the future from what I'm, I'm, I'm seeing and what I'm understanding. And people are going to be in a way to where they can move up Maslow's Pyramid because they're not having to work 40 hours a week and blah, blah, blah. So the opportunity is going to be for more people to question... Why am I here? Why am I taking up space? Now that I have the time and I don't have to worry about survival, what am I going to do? Okay? And so part of what Fantasy of Flight is to do is allow people to self-discover that for themselves. And the park system is just one aspect of it. I also see an aspect of where it's going to basically be a shopping mall of life's experiences and people that are serious about some aspect of the human experience are going to be on site Letting people know, here's an opportunity, here's an opportunity. So you're going to go through the shopping mall of life and figure out what you want to do. So after you come out of the park and you've hopefully met our mission statement, light that spark within, sure. which is a metaphor for what we truly are, infinite potential, coming into this world of life and expressing yourself in your own unique Is that way. another Kermit Weeks? in the world of aviation. Say again? Is there another Kermit Weeks in the world of aviation or somebody else that can take uh, well, no, no, no. Here and no, what's going to happen is the planet's going to take, once I leave, the planet's going to take it over, okay? So I see the collection ending up in, an, in a separate organization from the for-profit okay. side to where you can take advantage of grant subsidies, donations, and volunteers. But the difference is because they support the thing over here, they're getting part of the gate. So there's an income that supports sure. the sure. side of it. And, and I know in the, in, from you know, all the other aviation museums, uh, yeah, they have a gate that comes in the thing, but it'll never pay the light bill. Sure. You know, you still gotta pay all the salaries and blah, blah, blah. So they still have volunteers, donations, grants, subsidies. And, and the bottom line of business is, is if you've got a product most people aren't willing to pay for, you got a product most people don't want. Sure. Okay, so you have to create it and deliver something in a way that it can be financially successful. Otherwise, it's a charity. I'm done with charities. Well, this is awesome, Kermit. I think we, we covered pretty much what uh, App Tree is going to be. I think everyone is happy to know that the airplanes are here to stay, your vision is here to stay. So, is there anything else you want to add before we all close, uh, no, close this segment? Because we'll stay here all day. So yeah, yeah, yeah. All day. Um, no, I just, I, I think that, I just would have people to imagine that they lived in a world that they had the time and the, uh, the opportunity to look around and say, why am I taking up space here? If I imagine that I signed on the bottom line before I entered this life form and this life, you know, what am I here to experience? What am I here to learn? What am I here to leave? What potential do I have to musical instrument, dance, building an airplane, whatever it is, you know, what is that? If you now have the time and you could just focus on that, what would, what would you do? Okay, and that's that's where fantasy flights are in the future. Perfect. So to allow awesome. people to self-discover that. So yeah, great seeing well, you. Thank man. you. Good yeah, to see yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, awesome. yeah, 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 yeah. Cool.